In just the past few years, more anti-reproductive rights legislation has been proposed than in the 30 years combined following the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark ruling in Roe v. Wade. At the same time, maternal and infant mortality rates in the U.S. rival that of many developing countries and is the worst among nearly all developed nations. From limitations on contraception to threats of arrest for refusing C-sections and prosecutions for miscarriages, a troubling hostility is being fostered and encouraged towards women and their health in so many respects. At the University of California, Irvine School of Law, our Reproductive Justice Initiative is engaging multiple stakeholder communities. That includes scholars, policymakers, civil society, healthcare providers, students, and of course, the general public to address the problems of women's health and human rights, the incarceration of women and their children. And we're deeply concerned about the security and safety of women, and also about education on all of these topics. Through the Reproductive Justice Initiative, we've shined a bright light on the dramatic and complicated consequences for the lives of women and also girls in prisons and detention centers. It's a narrative that has been overlooked for far too long. This massive onslaught of legislation and focus on the abortion issue not only is designed to distract from many of the issues you heard from Professor Goodwin earlier, but also form and act as a, a kind of defamation against women. Although there is much discussion and occasional celebration in many uh, in racial progress in many ap aspects of American life, that same cannot be said concerning racial progress in the American criminal justice system. Racial disparity continues to exist, and the level of despair far outdistances the level of hope. In 1966, Dr. King said that family planning was urgent and necessary. He said that it was essential to our planet's health, to civil rights, and even economic liberation. Over 50 years ago, Dr. King made the case that family planning was a human right. We've called upon lawmakers in Washington to hear the truth about women's reproductive and health care access, the truth about violations of women's reproductive privacy, lack of access to reproductive health services, domestic violence, and sexual harassment. The truth is, we can't pretend these problems don't exist anymore. They are very real and growing. I'd like to thank Professor Michelle Goodwin and the Reproductive Justice Initiative for holding today's hearing to elevate the public discussion around reproductive justice and health care rights for women and girls above the misinformation and frankly the rhetoric that has that's been misogynist and has captured the attention of Congress, the public, and the media. It's no surprise to anyone in this room that women's health and rights are under attack from policymakers who seek to undermine women's agency and limit our sexual and reproductive choices, our access to sexual and reproductive health care that we need. We've joined forces with colleagues from across the world on these issues to address the shifts in family making and even how these issues impact the broader global environment. We seem to be at a critical moment when uh, legislatures, politicians, and the general voting population is concerned with the fiscal cost of the correctional system. And one of the hidden or latent costs it, you know, happens to be, what are these other collateral consequences? So there's research to show that children have a host of behavioral problems as a result of having a parent incarcerated. There's research to show that the parents are stigmatized in the labor market and have reduced earnings. Um, there's research to show that they face uh, increased health mortality risk as well as uh, comorbidities. And so there are a whole host of issues that are attached to having a family member or a community member incarcerated. Although women are 50%, in fact, more than 50% of the U.S. population, they comprise less than 20% of those who govern in their states. Now, what if women's voices mattered? 
What if leaders in Congress listened? What would they learn? What if women's health, safety, and dignity were valued? What if women achieved equal representation? Only by collaborating and taking action can we respond to the state, federal, and international health concerns confronting women and their families today.